tonight, but <clears throat> when Mike told me this is Sin was incoming, um, this is uh, the scripture that came to, came to mind. Uh, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Never fails. Uh, the Bible says that God is love. And, you know, we as humans can experience the emotion of love towards another person, whether it's a relative, a friend, uh, just a random person, or, or a significant other. But until we get a hold of the fact that God is love and how he loves us, we're not going to truly understand what love is. Uh, so it's, it's really difficult for a person to truly love someone else uh, and, and basically do the things that it says in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, you know, tomorrow I start the new chapter of one of, a new chapter in my life. Um, I start moving out of my house tomorrow. And Friday, the ending of another chapter is going to start getting written. Uh, but you know, I don't feel as if I failed because I know that I'm doing all of these things with the understanding that uh, it is with love that I have made the decisions that I have made to, to do these things. And uh, I know that one day my wife will truly come to understand that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Amen. you know, so I just encourage you to, you know, keep seeking that understanding of what the love of God is, because only then is when things are going to make sense. That's right. So, Amen. Amen. that's all I have. Amen. 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 Thank you. Does anyone have any prayer requests? Testimonies they would like to share. Yeah. James. I think I go everything you guys know me and I, I'm all right. I just wanna seek God's um preserve preservation, you know, and presence here to <laughs> have it this happen and that happen and this happen is where we can't be there for the guests and the world and I'm gonna try to be there.
thank you for bringing us into your presence, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for the work that you are doing in our lives. We thank you, Father, because you are bringing us together here for you to manifest in our lives and our spirit, for us to get understanding of what it is, Father, that you are trying to tell us. We also thank you, Father, for all the works that you're doing in our lives by restoring relationships, by healing all of our ailments and of those that are not here, Lord. We also thank you for your provision, Father. We thank you because we never lack anything. We always have more than enough, Father. We thank you, Father, for your revelation, revelation that we get through your word, through your Holy Spirit, for the understanding of your word so we can go out into this world and present you to others as you truly are, a loving Father, a loving God. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for giving us your only Son, the ultimate sacrifice, Lord, so that we be reconciled to you. We thank you, Father, because with you, everything is well. Father, we give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. It's all about you, Lord, and with you, with you, there's nothing that we cannot do. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing, and thank you for what you will do. It's very exciting, uh, the expectation of, of what we feel in our hearts that God's going to do based on the things that we continue to keep seeing. And uh, I don't know, but I can help but feel, and I don't know if you sometimes feel the same way, uh, like a kid at Christmas just waiting to open that present, yeah. all excited. Yeah. Oh, man. It's good. Okay, well, we don't have any announcements, so let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Hallelujah. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Hallelujah. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now resolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
praise you tonight, God, for another time to be here. Yes, Lord. To be together, Lord, in your name, to gather, Lord, to lift you up and to be drawn by your spirit. We just hunger and thirst, God, for more of you. Yes. As you instruct us to, Lord God, to draw near to you, to find a habitation in you. Hallelujah. And just to bless your mighty name for this offering, God, and the opportunity to give unto you. We will bless you. worship. one of the songs that was uh, when King is worship, but there's some lines of the song that I have make it is my my prayer and it says uh, wide-eyed and mystified may we be just like a child staring at the beauty of our King so that's what we're going to do hallelujah the Lord. hallelujah like tonight the sky is heavy feels like the wind are gonna change beneath my feet the earth is ready I know it's time for heaven's rain it's gonna rain Cause living water we desire To flood our hearts with holy fire Rain down All around the world we're singing Rain down Can you hear the earth is singing Rain down All around your people singing Rain Like tonight, the sky is heavy, feels like the winds are gonna change. Beneath my feet, the earth is ready. I know it's time for heaven's rain. It's gonna rain. To flood our hearts with holy fire is heavy, feels like it's time to dream again. I see the clouds, and yes, I'm ready to dance upon 
this barren land Hope in my hands Hallelujah! Cause living water we desire The blood our hearts and holy fire
Praise God. You know, when God created this earth, the first creation, it says he, he found that it was very good and he rested from that work. And we are a new creation in Christ. Now we're the dwelling place of God. We are where he manifests himself. And it's through each one of us, as we recognize that rest that God has provided, that God exists in right this moment in us. That's when God is most clearly manifested in each one of us when we're no longer focused on ourselves, on our works, on our efforts, but on his finished work. Not only is God satisfied, but we can be satisfied with that rest. He is a great and a mighty God. There is none like him. Nothing is impossible with him. Whatever it is you're facing tonight, whatever might show up in the morning, God is more than able. And the good news is, not only is he more than able, he is willing to take care of that situation, that circumstance, so that we can rest in the assurance of his provision, of his blessing, of his love, and his acceptance of each one of us. Praise God. That is good news, church. Hallelujah. That, it doesn't get any better than that. Praise the Lord. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's always there. Always the I am. Amen. Amen. For whatever your situation is, he's the answer. Praise God. Let's give him a big hand tonight. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thanks again, worship team. Great as always. Thank you, Izzy. You were tremendous tonight. Praise the Lord. And she's back. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. We'll move right into this tonight so that y'all can get out of here at a reasonable time and get up in the morning to do the stuff you got to do tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Good news is God will be with you in the morning when you get up, just like he is tonight when you go to bed. Praise God. He's been with us and will remain with us forever. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's, let's turn to the book of Mark. I want to read uh, one verse out of Mark chapter 1. We'll read verse 14. Mark 1, verse 14. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Everybody get your taxes paid? <laughs> that'll throw a wet blanket on the party, won't it? Praise the Lord. I was telling Roberto earlier, I said, uh, my uh, accountant, the CPA people that do the stuff for us, said, uh, well, Nathan, you just need to pay, it, pay your taxes with a smile. And I told her, I said, well, I tried that, but they demand money. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 14 now, verses 48 through 52. So, soon, when John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mark 14, verses 48 through 52. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now, 
that's in the Garden of Gethsemane. But all through the Gospels, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and he also talks about the kingdom of this world. Now, a kingdom is simply an administration, a way of ordering things, a way of getting things done. And then you have the king, which is over the kingdom. So he determines how it is you're going to do whatever it is you've got to do, right? He's the one who determines the order of things, the, the priorities, in other words, and the, and the how we're going to go about getting those things done within that kingdom. For example, in, in this country, we don't have kings. We don't have a monarchy. We have a, uh, we have a representative uh, republic or representative government, a representative democracy, and we elect a president. Well, with every time, you all know this, you've been around long enough to have seen some presidents elected, and whenever that happens, there's a new administration, right? And generally what happens is whatever was necessarily the priorities of the last administration isn't necessarily the priorities of the next administration. So everything changes. They have different priorities. Basically, the job is to run the country, but the things that they see as that are important and need to be done first and put the most emphasis on, they change from administration to administration. The sad part about that is what I've learned over the years is that even though the priorities change, it's usually business as usual. Whoever the president is, it, they just simply fall into the trap of doing basically the same stuff. True with Congress, true with senators, it's just the way of the world, praise the Lord. So they, this new administration, whatever it might be, they, they come in and the old order, order of things ends and there is now a new order of things instituted as a result of that. So Jesus contrasts the kingdom of this world with the kingdom of God. Now, these are different, believe me. They're different administrations, but they literally are different. So let's look at that in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 22, and you see a contrast between the world's uh, priorities, the world's uh, administration, and Jesus, the kingdom of God. So Jesus lift up, he says, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and he said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. All right, now let's look at Luke Again, still verse, uh, chapter 6, but verses 24 through 26. Woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. So you see value changes here, and uh, priorities all of a sudden are different. So these two kingdoms, these two administrations of reality, and that's what we're talking about, the way they administer reality or truth. These two sets of priorities and values, they meet dramatically in the Garden of Gethsemane. You see it. Uh, explode basically there. The, the fact that Jesus has one agenda and the world has another agenda. And they come headlong into confrontation at that point. Let's go back to Mark chapter 14 and read ver verses 43 through 46. Immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whom, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. So, uh, actually, the, the, the term that we have today for the kiss of death 
originates right here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody knows what it means. It means something that causes your destruction. Yeah. Like somebody gives you the kiss of death, that means it's bad news. It's nothing good is going to come of it, right? But here's what's interesting. How does this king react to this kiss and his arrest? Uh, Mark 14, 46 through 49. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. So Jesus is saying, If you came at me with swords because you think I'm going to retaliate with a sword, then you don't understand me at all. You haven't figured out my kingdom or my priorities or my values. But what Judas and these others that are with him but don't understand is that Jesus is leading a revolution. But it's a different kind of revolution. It's a much greater revolution than history has ever known before or since. Now what happens in the kingdom of this world is that revolutions come and administrations change and the truth is, even with the revolutions and the administrative changes, business basically goes on pretty much the same. Right. Republican, Democrat, communist, whatever. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Whatever's going on in that country, in that administration, when it changes, even as dramatic as some revolutions are, ultimately it ends up being the same thing. The rich get richer, the poor get poor, the people in power control, and everybody else has to bow their knee to that. So everything is about those in power, they got it. What they want is what they're going to get. And even though the people who are not in power always say, oh, if we could just get in there, there'd be a great change. Your income would increase. Your, your, this would be better and that would be better. Then they get in and it's just another thing. Maybe you get a little thing here, a little there. But basically it goes on as usual. The people in power continue to get more power and we <laughs> we are on the other end, praise the Lord. And it's true everywhere. It's just, it's just the reality, amen, of this world. Business goes on as usual. Because they're not real revolutions. When Jesus came, he brought a revolution. But what has resulted from that revolution in many cases is religion, which is basically business as usual. It's still about our strength. It's still about our ability. It's still about our goodness and our effectiveness. Amen? Amen? Jesus isn't just putting a different people into power here, though. He's bringing a totally different administrative reality. People don't get it because they're used to things being pretty much always the same, even with religion. But what Jesus is doing is so dramatically different and so revolutionary that they can't even see it and comprehend it. The kingdom of God, which is Jesus, by the way, kingdom is in us. And it isn't revolutionary, uh, I mean, it, it isn't a revolution that you can stop with swords. Any other one, you would just get more men more weapons, more soldiers, whatever. And, and you could expect to stop the revolution or have your revolution, whichever it might be. But in this case, in the, in the revolution that Jesus has brought, it, it isn't stopped with swords. You can't stop it with weapons because he's not about a sword at all. Right. Now, Judas isn't the only one who doesn't get this. Uh -huh. Jesus had said, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, he said, my kingdom's not going to be like the kingdoms that you've experienced in the past. It's going to be altogether different. But they didn't understand that. To Peter and to all of these people, Jesus is saying, my kingdom is completely different than the world's. That's why we're in the world, but we're not of the world, and we don't fit. When you actually live by kingdom principles and values, <laughs> there's resistance. You don't just fit in with everybody else, especially the people who really are living under the world's kingdom. 
the world um, administration, praise the Lord. So this is a total, total change of priority. And you can see it in, in everything that Jesus did. Why? Because Jesus isn't like the rulers that have come before who get power in order to change by that power and cause people to submit and succumb to them. But Jesus came and he changes the priorities by saying, I'm going to love my enemies. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a thought. I mean, that's different, isn't it? I'll love my enemies. Amen. I'll give up my wealth. I'll become poor so that you can be rich. When was the last time we saw that happen? Praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, it, he's, he, his priorities are so diametrically opposed and different to whatever has been before. I'll give my life. Right? When was the last time a really wealthy, powerful person gave their life? No, they're, we're giving our lives to them so that they can have what they have. It's, it's us that go to war. Amen? It's us that are sacrificed. Now, I'm not trying to create a revolution here. I'm just saying that's the facts. That's just the way it is. That's the way it's always been. And as far as this world's concerned, that's the way it will always be. But Jesus had a totally different revolution going on here. I'll come and I'll serve you. You're not going to serve me. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 14, verses 48 through 52 again. I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. Praise the Lord. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now, Mark writes this, and uh, there are some uh, Bible uh, scholars who believe that this guy was Mark, who had his clothes ripped off of him as he was running away from Jesus' captors. But whoever it was, it, it's an eye-opener here for us, because this happens, and then everybody deserts Jesus. Everybody flees the scene. Peter and all the other disciples who had spent years with him, at least three and a half that we know of, mm -hmm. believed in him, followed him, and they desert him at the first real test of the kingdom. That is to say, I, I mentioned this uh, Sunday, I think, but the test isn't coming from God. Right. The test is the enemy to see what kingdom you belong to. Because the scripture says, whomever you submit to them, you are a slave, or to they rule over you. So Satan is checking out this scene to find out who's in what kingdom. Because after all, he is the prince of the power of the air. He is, Jesus said, the king of this world. This world system is headed by Satan. So the, the, the question here is Satan's trying to find out who's in what kingdom. Who do I have control over? Amen? So they desert him after this first test. And one guy is so determined to save his own skin, his self, he runs away naked. Now in the Bible, nakedness is associated always with shame. Remember, and, and guilt. You know, remember in the scripture where it talks about your nakedness shall be revealed, and it talks about in the temple how they, they were clothed that their nakedness not, would not be revealed. They had, as they went up the stairs to do their, to do their uh, uh, ministry in terms of the sacrifices and so forth, they had to wear certain kind of garments. Always, always nakedness in the scripture is related to shame and, and uh, guilt. So it's, only, it's perfectly appropriate here in this case, that this guy, who happens to be an absolute coward under the circumstances, goes home naked, mm -hmm. running like a wild man for fear. Amen? So naked suits this 
context perfectly. Now, in Mark's recounting of this uh, episode, he's reminding us of another garden, the Garden of Eden. And there were two people given a test there. God's kingdom or this serpent? Tree of life, knowledge of good and evil. And they failed. And they were exposed as naked. And they fled in shame. Hiding from God. Centuries later, there's another garden and another test that we come on to. And everybody fails. Everybody fails one way or another. They're either waving swords around and screaming violence and authority and power, or they're running away naked and ashamed. But something's different this time. In the middle of this garden, there's someone who's passing the test. The test isn't God, as I said. It's Satan asking, what kingdom are you really a part of? Where is your allegiance? Who is your Lord? Why is everybody else running and failing? Because their only reality is the world's sword. Self-effort. Your strength. Your positioning. Your power. Your ability. Even religion is still about that. Self-effort. To whom you submit, they become your God. They become your Lord. Right. Why? Because these people are afraid. They're afraid they're, somebody's going to arrest them. Somebody's going to find fault with them and discipline them. Or... Maybe somebody's going to kill him. Mm -hmm. Or somebody will start a revolution that will remove them from power. Yeah. When you, you know, the scripture talks about Paul and how that when he was preaching, grace people came and said, are you, are you telling us that because where sin abounds, grace doth that much more abound that, than that we ought to sin more so that there can be more grace. But now Paul didn't preach that, but that he preached grace so radically that that's what people were thinking. And nothing's changed. Because religion, religion wants, still wants control. It doesn't want to lose power. That's why we have laity, Amen. Jesus said, I hate the spirit of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans, what it really means is hierarchy. Yes. Jesus hates the idea that there was a priestly group, and to this day it exists, mm -hmm. just call them pastors or, or apostles or prophets or whatever, who somehow, if they don't actually come right out and say it, imply it, and the people are complicit in this by saying, we got to go to this person. We got to, you know, submit to this person, and just whatever they say is. We don't have to worry about what the scripture actually says. They're going to interpret it for us. <laughs> They're going to give us the answers. And Jesus hated that. That's why he said, "You're all kings and priests. Yes. We have different functions, but it doesn't elevate any of us over any of the rest of us. Right. We all can hear God. We can all. That's why we have testimonies. That's why we have people sharing because." You got stuff I don't have. You got experiences I'm not having. This, this is what I do, but it doesn't certainly doesn't put me in any position that's any greater than anybody else's. Come on. But religion has a way of elevating the priesthood, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. and causing everyone else then to submit to that. Right. That wasn't the plan Jesus had. Mm -hmm. Jesus would that we all become kings and priests. Paul even said you should all be prophets. Everyone should be prophesying. Yes. That's the kingdom. 
That's God's way. Where everyone is on a level playing field. All equal. No big eyes, little U's, you know, no, no uh, special, extremely spiritual, and others just duds. We all have the same potential. We all have the same spirit. We all have the same anointing because we all have the same Jesus. Praise the Lord. It's just a question of if we're going to act on it. Praise the Lord. So these people, they're afraid. They're afraid they're going to die. They're going to be arrested. They're going to be harassed. They're going to lose their position. Amen? That's true of the religious leaders. It's true of the Romans. And it's true of the individual. Self. I'll lose my self-awareness, my self-consciousness, my way of being able to elevate myself in a way that I can look down on somebody else and say, well, I'm not as bad as they are. You know, I've done more good stuff than they have. But here's what Jesus does. He takes the shame and the guilt of Adam and Eve and every one of us and what happens? He goes naked to the cross. Yes. He bears our humiliation, our shame, our guilt. You know, the pictures always de you know, describe him or, or show him there with a loincloth. That ain't the way it happened. Crucifixion was a humiliation as well as a torture. And one of the ways that they did that was to strip them totally naked when they would crucify him. Jesus took our shame. He took our guilt. He took our nakedness to the cross. To the kingdom of God, it seems unnatural from the worldly perspective. Psychologically, especially, it seems just wrong, right? That you would embrace weakness. That you would accept rejection. That you would just live with tribulation, struggles, strife. That you'd become poor for someone else to be rich. Mm. That you would suffer so that not your best friend or your spouse wouldn't have to suffer, but so that your enemies wouldn't have to suffer. Mm. I mean, that'll get you in a psych ward. Today, it just doesn't make sense. That's, we'd call that masochism. Embracing pain, looking for it. It's psychologically unhealthy. And the others would say, well, not only that, but it's impossible to live that way. And I agree. It is. But that is exactly what Jesus came to do. You see, religion, here's what religion does. It, it tells us that Jesus Christ is an example for us to live like. It's not true. Jesus Christ as an example will kill you. It will crush you. It will destroy you. You'll never live up to it. You'll always fail. You'll do good in some areas. Maybe you'll do good in all areas for a little while, but something will happen and you'll, you'll mess up. You'll get angry. You'll lose your temper. You'll get even. You'll, you'll, you'll do something. Because it's impossible. He never came to be an example. He came to be a substitute, an exchange. I'm not saying we shouldn't try to be better people. <laughs> That's just... I would think common sense. But to think that you're going to live this perfect life in the flesh is, is insane. It can't, and it won't happen. If you fail in one small point of the law, you have failed in every single bit of it. That's what Jesus taught. But, Jesus Christ as the Lamb, as our sacrifice, that'll save you. Praise the Lord. 
On the cross, Jesus is getting what we deserve so that we can get what he deserves. When you really understand what Jesus has done for you, it frees you. It sets you free to do good naturally. Yes. Not with a guilty conscience, not with a, as Tim was saying, not with a, you know, uh, maybe somebody saw me in the dark, so, you know, what's the point in trying to do good? God knows our, our weakest, uh, stupidest, foolishest, uh, sinfulest mistakes, and he still loves us. He still embraces us. I've said some things to God that I wouldn't even say to one, any of you. And I bet you, you have too. Why? Because God already knows what I'm thinking. He already knows what I'm feeling. He knows my doubts. He knows my fears. They're not for everybody. I don't even like to admit them to myself sometimes. Right? I don't want to be negative. I'm not a negative person. In fact, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of nauseatingly positive. Yes. Ask my wife. Yes. I don't like negative stuff. I don't want to hear negative stuff. You don't hear it coming from me. I'll just shut up if I can't be positive. But God knows uh, I can be as negative as anybody. Uh, I have fears. I have doubts. We all have in this flesh, in this humanity, we see things. We're exposed to things that we go, I just don't understand. I don't get it. But my answer is always, you go back to here. doesn't matter what I think. What, I, what matters is what God has said. That's the truth. That's reality. Amen. So when you realize that you're made righteous by his grace, not by your achievements, mm -hmm. and you are loved by God, yes. it changes the way you look at life. Yes. It does. Yes. It'll change anybody. It's revolutionary. Thank you, Lord. You, this, this is something you can't get from a psychiatrist. You won't get it from a sociologist. Right. You won't get it from a self-help group. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things. I'm just saying they cannot change a person. They can cause some outward behavioral changes. But this changes you at the core, at the way you actually look at situations and circumstances and other people. It's revolutionary. It came about as the result of a revolution. Yes. Not just a change in administration but a complete inversion of everything that was and everything that is to be. Mm -hmm. And Jesus did this. Hallelujah. And it happens to each one of us when we're born again. We, re we receive a kingdom yes. that doesn't fit this world's kingdoms. Mm -hmm. And it causes us to look at things totally different. Have you ever noticed you can sit down to an unbeliever and watch a news program and get up with two totally different takes on everything that you just saw. Yes. Not saying it was a negative, but the way we respond to it, the way we react to it, is altogether different. Because right. Right. we're not tied to whatever that news anchor is saying. Right. Or whatever the latest fad or fashion or problem or issue. Yes, I, it concerns me for the world, mm -hmm. but it doesn't frighten me for myself personally. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's revolutionary. Let's, let's look at one more scripture here before we wrap up tonight. Daniel chapter 5, and we'll read verses 1 through 5. We are the product of the first and only real revolution that's ever yes. taken place. Thank you, Lord. And it changes reality yes. in this world and in that world. Amen? Amen? You can have truth and facts. Facts are one thing. The doctor says this. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. The truth is, by his stripes you're healed. There, there's, a, there's a different reality. The fact is, you may come up $50 short every month. The truth is, he'll pour out riches. 
that you can't even contain. The truth is, I will meet all of your needs according to my riches and glory. Amen? Amen. Yes. Facts are one thing, but truth defines reality. Yes. Praise the Lord. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone, the gods of this world. And in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand, and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Drop down to verse uh, 25, and read, we'll read verses 25 through 28. And this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharsin. This is the interpretation of the thing, Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Mm. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Mm -hmm. There's people that are living for themselves. Right. People whose God is the God of this world. People who live in this system, in this reality. Doesn't matter whether they're religious or whether they're secular, it's the same. The kingdom of this world, days are numbered. You can write it down. You can leave it somewhere for them to find after we're gone. But the kingdoms of this world are numbered. Mm -hmm. They have a finite place in which they will end. But the kingdom of our God, the revolutionary kingdom, the scripture says of it, there shall be no end. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It reminds me, this whole thing of the, the, the man in the Gadarenes. He was possessed. And the scripture says that he was running around naked like a madman after contact with Jesus after an encounter with this revolutionary the scripture says he was found seated at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind mm -hmm. that's the world naked running swinging their swords, screaming and hollering, carrying on, threatening, intimidating, or they're just running away naked. Embarrassed, ashamed, guilty, right? We are clothed and in our right mind. Can you say praise the Lord? <laughs> Hallelujah. We have a robe of righteousness freely given to us. We have the mind of Christ. That, friends, revolutionary. We have experienced the first and the only revolution to come to this place. And it has transformed us from crazy, naked, sword-wielding, stave-carrying maniacs, children of Satan, into the meek that will inherit the earth. Yes. The children of God. Amen. And he did it all. He paid the price. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, this revolution never ends. Mm -hmm. It goes on forever. Mm -hmm. And on the way, it's picking up followers. It's picking up new creations in Christ that will rally and praise him throughout eternity for what he's done in all of our lives. And he's done it all by grace. He did it all in this revolutionary fashion. 
of becoming us so that we can become like him. Hallelujah. Say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. The Lord is good. <laughs> praise the Lord. Appreciate everybody here tonight. Let's live like the revolutionaries that we are. Hallelujah. Amen. We don't, we don't have to use subterfuge. We don't have to hide. We don't sneak around in the dark. We can be bold and open about the fact that our God has come. Amen. And he's overthrown the administration. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. He's in charge yes. in spite of what anybody says. Amen. Yes. Amen. The Lord bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great rest of the week. Hope to see you back here Sunday.